for the next lecture, our own professor and the head of the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at the Faculty of Pharmacy and Biochemistry in Zagreb, Professor Jerka Dumic, will join us to discuss personalized healthcare and show what kind of role pharmacists and medical biochemists have in it. Professor Jerka Dumic has received her undergraduate education in medical biochemistry and obtained her PhD degree in biomedical science at the University of Zagreb. She was doctoral fellow at the Universitat für Bodenkultur in Vienna, Austria, and postdoctoral fellow at Johns Hopkins University, Baltimore, USA. She served as a dean of faculty of pharmacy and biochemistry, University of Zagreb, and is currently teaching biochemistry course, uh, immunology, personalized healthcare, and molecular ba uh, basis of disease and uh, therapy. Uh, Professor Dumic, are you here with us? Yes, I am. Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that I'm uh, really pleased and honored that uh, I'm invited and that I'm a part of this um, event. And I would like to thank the organizing, organizing, organizing committee and organizers for providing me this opportunity to share with other people some ideas and uh, uh, thoughts about the personalized healthcare. So I'm teaching that course for the no last 10 years and I really enjoyed with my students because they helped me in a way that I understand the personalized um, medicine and healthcare from the point of uh, view of the pharmacist. So uh, I'm sure that uh, you would agree with me that, that uh, never in a human uh, history we were so aware of um, health, importance of health, preserving health, like in nowadays. Also, uh, what is the fact is that the medicine and technology were never developing so fastly like uh, in the last 20 years. Yet, we testify the increase of different kinds of diseases, uh, especially diseases like the cancer, the, the cardiovascular diseases, autoimmune diseases, and so on. So, um, maybe 10 years ago, the, the scientists and clinicians realized that they have to change their approach, not only to patients, but also the, the approach to the disease. So, uh, this is how the personalized medicine was born. Okay, just have, you have to tell me how I can page down. How can I uh, move the slides, please? Okay, here. Okay, great. Yeah, I found, found it. So, uh, there are many different definitions on uh, personalized medicine, but my favorite one is that it is an optimization of healthcare using all available patient data. In the last few years, uh, the new uh, uh, name was uh, appeared, so it was a precision medicine, also the stratified medicine. So many different ways how to explain that uh, it's not only the, the, the patient, it's not only the disease, that, but the many different factors can affect on treatment, on uh, disease course, and of course the, the effect of the therapy. So, um, just give me a moment. I will. Uh, do you agree that I uh, turn off uh, the the video? Maybe you should be more focused on the presentation. If you agree. Okay. So. The, the Western world, the public health in, in, um, in the Western world uh, is facing new challenges. From acute to chronic diseases, uh, there is appearance of novel, but also old infectious diseases like tuberculosis. Is. Then the aging population, lack of new drugs, and what is very important, unequal availability of medical care. The other big problem is the increase of health expenditure. As you can see, in most of the European country, 10% of the uh, GDP uh, uh, go, uh, goes to, to the health care, 
and uh, the trends are uh, showing that uh, that uh, expenditure is growing. So in 2020, we expect that that will be over 10% of GDP in the European countries. So what we have to do is transform health and medicine in the future. Today, we still treat the disease when symptoms appear and normal function is lost. What we would like to do is to intervene before symptoms appeared and preserve normal functions for, the, for as long as possible. We also have to understand much better the molecular cellular events that lead to the disease so uh, we can understand preclinical molecular events and that, that new approach will definitely reduce the expensive uh, uh, treatment. So what is the basis of first-life medicine? In 2000, uh, the human genome was sequenced, and this is the, the moment when the era of new approach, new, new way how to, to understand the, 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 the humans, uh, the disease, and many other things uh, uh, started. So today we can consider personalized medicine as a um, dividend of human genome project. Uh, in addition to genomics, many different omics started to develop. So today, molecular screens combined with clinical data can uh, help to point more precise treatment options for each individual patient. So in that moment, we shifted from the approach one size fits to all to approach the right treatment to right person in the right time. So we are aware the major drugs are infective for many. You, I'm sure you know that statins are effective in only 30 to 70 percent of people. Beta-2 agonists only from 30 to 60 percent of people. Also, we have to be aware that some drugs are harmful for many patients. So just in hospitals, more than 6.7 percent of patients, it means like a 2.2 million patients each year in the United States experience serious drug, uh, adverse drug reactions. So due to these serious adverse drug reactions, many very, very good drugs had to be withdrawn uh, from the market. So in that moment, uh, the question was right up, are good drugs going to wrong people? So. In therapy, we have to balance between efficacy and toxicity. And you have to be aware that adverse drug reactions are the fourth leading cause of death in the United States. On the other hand, when we want to bring a new drug to the market, we have to pass a very, very long and very complex uh, uh, pathway. So uh, usually the, 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 the period from the idea to market the drugs, uh, it, it takes from 10 to 15 years. And this is a pretty long time. And what is more important, that it is a very, very expensive way. So when we compare the, the uh, expenses, what, uh, what it was in early uh, 2000, and now, you can see that there is a difference of 2.5 uh, uh, times uh, what we have to invest in uh, drug development than we had to do that 10 years ago. So it, is, it was estimated that of 10,000 newly uh, synthesized compounds per year, only one will reach the market per year. And the cost of, of from the concept to the market is more than two billion US dollars. So what we need are safer and more effective drugs. And in that way, that omics approach could have, help us to identify disease targets, to speed the clinical trials, and advance more drugs that are safe and effective from, for specific population. So that approach we have to, to apply from the moment when we want to identify a target up to the moment when the, the, the drug is at the market and when we can uh, combine uh, molecular diagnostic te tests uh, to find the optimal population which can uh, receive the drugs.
you know, of course, in an effective way. So we have to be aware that the most uh, killing, let's say, diseases today, like the cancer, cardiovascular diseases, uh, uh, neurodegenerative diseases, and also many autoimmune diseases, are complex genetic diseases. So they are the consequence of combining not only uh, uh, our genome, but also many epigenetic, postgenomic, and regulatory events, but what is very, very important, the effect of environment are huge. So it is very difficult to define what is the real cause of that of these diseases. But we, what we have to keep in mind is that virtually all diseases have a genetic component, even those which are not, let's say, directly related to, to, to genome, like, let's say, AIDS, we have to know that uh, uh, different patients uh, will have a different cause, uh, cor uh, disease course and they will respond differently on the treatment. On the other hand, <coughs> on monogenic disease like uh, uh, cystic fibrosis, is, we also have a part on an environmental component which is also very, very important and can affect uh, um, the course of the disease. One other thing what is also important, that in most cases, that many genes and environmental factors uh, uh, contributing a, a small risk. So it is very, very hard to, uh, to know uh, what are the genes, which genes uh, are involved in development of, of uh, the disease. <clears throat> so from very simple uh, 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 point of view, what can we do with the uh, uh, Human Genetic Association study is to define from the patient's group with the same diagnosis and same prescription which drug, uh, sorry, which population will have the benefits from the drug and uh, to whom that drug will not be toxic. In the same time, what we have to do to recognize those who will uh, not have a benefit from, from the um, um, that, that drug, or what is maybe even more important, that we detect those patients to whom that, that uh, drug could be uh, uh, toxic. Uh, our point of view was, was also um, uh, spread thanks to the gen genome-wide association studies. These studies provided us information on many different genes, which uh, in the first moment you will not ever connect to particular diseases. But thanks to these studies, we know that some genes which are not directly involved, or we don't see how are they involved, also could have the impact on the development of the disease and the course of the disease. So uh, different atomics developed in the last uh, 20 years, let's say. But for us, in this moment, uh, is very important pharmacogenetics and pharmacogenomics. Sometimes we mix these two um, points. So uh, what is the pharmacogenetics? This is the more narrow uh, uh, approach, let's say. So we define that as the genetic differences in metabolic pathways which can affect individual response to drug, both in terms of therapeutic effect as well as adverse uh, effects. Pharmacogenomics is more wide approach, and that is a general study of all uh, uh, the many different genes that determine the drug uh, behavior. Uh, you will hear about the pharmacogenetics and ph pharmacogenomics later this evening from my former student, Lana Painovich. I forgot her last name now when uh, she got married, so sorry, Lana. But definitely applying of pharmacogenomics uh, could help us uh, in uh, choosing the best targets of, for, for a particular drug to understand better the target, to improve early, detect, uh, early decision uh, making and uh, predict efficacy and safety. safety. Altogether, Pharmacogenomics can provide us uh, more effective and safer drugs, reliable methods for estimation of drug dosing, improvement of disease screening, better uh, vaccines, uh, improvement of drug discovery and drug approval process, and reduction of treatment costs. 
but the, the story is not so simple. Today we are dealing with a huge quantity of data. So what we have to do is to integrate all this data and to try to understand them. So sometimes um, we can be very, very confused uh, about these data. So it is very, very important uh, uh, point is that we have to find a, a, a cause, meaning to precisely connect the, the cause of something and the consequences of something. I will show you <clears throat> one very nice example where when you uh, compare divorce rate in Maine and uh, consumption of margarine per capita in the United States, you will find a huge correlation, more than 99%. But of course, there is no connection between divorce rate in Maine and consumption of margarine. So we, we have to be very, very careful, careful about the cause-effect relationship. So what we have to do? We have to explore all types of application beyond diagnostic therapeutics, have the evidence, the policies, and education, of course, and, as, uh, and uh, over that, the resources to that. And what we also need is multidisciplinary research which will be combined of basic clinical and population sciences. So when it, we talk about the personalized medicine, we usually think about one particular patient. But what we would like to do is to shift, to expand the personalized medicine to personalized healthcare and make a multidisciplinary field a concern with the effective and responsible translation of genome-based knowledge and technologies to improve population health. So, in addition to discovery and development resulting in the application, we have to evaluate our results and make the evidence-based recommendation of policies. Then we have to implement all of that and through the healthcare and prevention programs, measure the effectiveness and outcome research, and then have some impact for, uh, on the population health. So only through the integration of knowledge of different kind of, of studies, we can improve the public health. So uh, before the big data moment, how we uh, tested our hypothesis? We came up with a question, we designed an experiment to test it, and wait for new data to come in, and then form our conclusions. Today, thanks to big data, we can really improve the, the, the design of our experiment. We can uh, integrate the information from big data, and then our conclusion will be m more uh, uh, reliable and uh, correct. So we have to use a, a, a strong epidemiological foundation, develop a robust knowledge integration process, use and not avoid principles of evidence-based medicine and population screening, and develop a robust translational research agenda beyond bench to bedside. So this is a concept of precision medicine. We have to integrate the system we have to facilitate discovery in science and have a more efficient clinical research to have a good answers. So what we try to do is to shift the old paradigm when we treated when we were treated with the disease. That trial and error treatment was totally ineffective, matter of fact, and very, very expensive. And what we try to do today is to um, have an efficient medical care in health management. So what we want to do to perform a molecular screening to uh, detect early some changes or some predisposition for the disease, have a rapid effective treatment, and in that way improve the quality uh, of care. What do we expect from the future? Uh, we would like to, to know the predisposition for some particular disease. 
treat the molecular markers, markers, not the symptoms and the disease, and in that way we will be able to, maybe not to prevent, but at least the postpone the, the appearance of the symptoms and the appearance, of course, of the disease. So the future paradigm includes four Ps, prediction, personal, personalization, preemptive approach, and of course, participatory of the patients. In that way, we will be able to shift the personalized medicine to the personalized healthcare. So from the basic biomedical research, clinical knowledge and the research, we will improve the personal health, but also the population health. Now you can write the question, so how can the pharmacist or medical biochemist, of course, can contribute to this system? What we know is that uh, today we, we notice um, uh, increase in drug use, increase in number of drugs, increase in complex, complex drug regime, inappropriate prescribing, increase in self-medication, increased use of alternative medicine, and increase what I like to call a wiki knowledge. We are aware of excessive and inappropriate medication. Our patients, they don't hear us very well. Their health literacy is pretty low. And what we also know that there is an adequate communication between healthcare providers and inefficient communication between patients and the pharmacists. So how can pharmacists contribute? I think that matter of fact that in the future pharmacists, community pharmacists, clinical pharmacists, will be one of the most important um, um, clue in, in, in the story about the public health care. You can find the pharmacy shop on almost on every corner. Uh, also, um, pharmacists are reachable. It's very uh, easy to enter into the pharmacy shop and talk to pharmacists. And uh, I think that the pharmacists, uh, with their knowledge, with their attitude, can contribute a lot. So uh, they can talk with the patient uh, about the drug history. They can make a patient medication profiles. They could provide a very, very good information on drugs. They can uh, evaluate the drug use. They can monitor the treatment efficacy and toxicity. And they can also provide the drug counseling. But I think that um, one of the most important role of pharmacists in that process is education. Uh, that education goes in, in, in two directions. First direction is to transfer your knowledge to patients, and on the, in the other way is to increase your uh, personal knowledge. When we think about um, the, the, the education of pharmacists, uh, in many, many cases, university education is focused more on acquisition of their theoretical knowledge and less on skills and the way uh, they are used. What we would like to do is to um, build a knowledge-based competencies or the competencies-based education. And we have to bridge the gap between a pharmacy curriculum all over the Europe and needs of healthcare system and pharma industry. So we should be focused on student-centered learning in order to develop problem-solving skills interprofessional education, and of course, training in the workplace. New trends in teaching are shifting from memorizing to analyzing, evaluating, and creating. On the other hand, lecturing, reading, is not so efficient like discussion, practice, and teaching the others. So uh, this is why I think that it's very important for pharmacy students to learn how to apply uh, your knowledge for the patient benefit. And this is also the task for their professors and teachers, of course. So you have to improve your skills. Skills today are very, very important. And this is the only way how your knowledge and um, professional experience could be transferred to the student, to the, uh, 
uh, patient. So, uh, in addition to knowledge and skills, I, I think uh, one very important is that you develop your awareness of your knowledge and attitudes. You have to be proud about your uh, profession and uh, in that way you will be able to compete or maybe compete, maybe to contribute to healthcare uh, system together with other healthcare providers like uh, physicians, um, general practitioners, nurses and many others. So uh, I think as a conclusion that pharmacists will be a very, very important partner, partner in personalized healthcare in the future. So what is important that in addition to knowledge, which is definitely the basis, you have to develop your skills, your attitudes, your awareness, and not forget about lifelong learning. So I will finish my talk with one cartoon uh, published uh, almost uh, 16 years ago, uh, which is named Here's My Sequence. Um, so the, the, such approach maybe is not realistic for the moment, but I definitely think that the pharmacist in the future will be able to uh, contribute a lot in personalized healthcare. So uh, thank you for, for your attention. I really enjoyed this, this talk and now I'll be glad uh, if I'll be able to um, give you answers on your questions. So I'll start my webcam so now we can talk. Well, professor, you can start to share your camera. You can click on share my webcam. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you for your lecture. It was really interesting. Uh, with this, I'd like to uh, start the Q and A. Yelena asked a question: um, How financially viable will it be to shift our interest into developing personalized medicine, considering the enormous cost of existing healthcare system? So the problem is the healthcare system is very expensive because it is not efficient. So what it, it, it's not uh, definitely it's not easy. Uh, you need the government, you need the ministry, you need many many uh, parts uh, in in that process if you want to do that. But uh, in one moment, because y y you could see that the trends of uh, increase uh, uh, of uh, G uh, the percentage of the GDP that goes to to healthcare is enormous. Uh, it, it is not uh, um, sustainable. In the future, if we do not change the approach, our total uh, our system will be totally collapsed. So I think that it is very expensive, of course, but the, the result of that is enormous. So this is why uh, the, um, the idea of personalized medicine is maybe not yet recognized. Um, in, in a way how it should be recognized, but I'm positive then the, that in the near future the personalized uh, healthcare will be a part of our life. Okay, thank you for your answer. Uh, Charlotte asks, uh, can we yeah. say that personalized medicine is the future of proactive pharmacovigilance? Um, not only that, because uh, pharmacovigilance is focus on effects of, of a particular drug. So pharmacovigilance is definitely a part of personalized uh, medicine and personalized healthcare and uh, should be involved in that. But it, the personalized uh, uh, healthcare is much wider approach than pharmacovigilance is. And I think we have time for another question. Uh, she uh, she part, uh, asked what uh, would be the best approach to increase our skills on a personal level. Uh, the personal level meaning um, how to contribute to personalized medicine or in general. That, that's what. I'm, so I I think that because he he doesn't uh, mention uh, personalized medicine, I think that uh, he. He was talking about the skills. So, uh, one way 
uh, how you can improve it is also through this um, this uh, Congress. So definitely you should take part in many, many different activities. Of course, what we as the teachers, I mean the, the curricula, um, I mean the universities, what we have to do is to totally and completely change our way of teaching. What we like to do is to teach. Uh, what we have to do is to force, let's say, students to teach. Um, this is how you will improve um, your skills in a way that you will improve your communication skills, your presentation skills, uh, if you will work on, let's say, um, project-based learning or um, problem-based learning, you will have to communicate with your uh, team, so we, you will have to be a, a team worker. If there, there are many, many ways how you can do that, but only uh, it, this is a, um, a very important thing is that uh, uh, students should uh, um, be aware that skills are important to recognize which skills um, they don't have and try uh, to improve them. If, you, um, if uh, Sarah also asks uh, what is the best way to learn more about the best way to apply your knowledge into the patient's benefit, and she also asked uh, if she could um, have your contact to um, for more inquiries. Of course, definitely um, you can give them my uh, email address, and I will I'll be glad to 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 answer them. I mean, in more details. Then I mean, I don't know if we'll have time um, today to answer all questions. So yes, please, you can give them my email address. Um, so um, the question was, what is the best way to learn more about the best way how to apply your knowledge in the patient's benefit? Um, definitely um, the first step is to improve your knowledge. Knowledge on genomics, uh, knowledge on pharmacogenomics or pharmacogenetics. Uh, and uh, to talk with with the uh, patient, to read the, the recent uh, literature. So there are many ways how you can do that. And what is very, very important that you keep it, that in mind, that this is very important. And you have to, to, uh, um, to look at, at patients uh, as a, a, a big, very, very complex system. It's not, you know, this is a patient, this is a drug, and there is a link. This system is much more complex, and there are many, many interactions. You have to listen, patients. I, I really like um, Daniela's uh, quote at the end, that the best way how you will um, um, teach is uh, that you start to, to, uh, to listen. So this is a one way. I, I, sorry if I, I didn't give you maybe the most precise the answer, but um, if you'll write me an email, I'll do my best uh, to give you the explanation in more details. Thank you, Professor, uh, for your interesting uh, lecture and for answer, answering all the questions. Uh, we can now uh, go on to the virtual, uh, virtual break if it's okay with everyone.